we didn't think as a school within Yale that we should open a building which is as, if I can use this pun, groundbreaking as this building will be without having a solid intellectual discussion about the significance of what is happening. And so we've assembled a very talented group of panelists uh, to discuss this, the question of the contribution of built structures to the environment or the negative impact of built structures on the environment. It could go either way. Uh, and the format will be as follows. I'm gonna quickly introduce our four distinguished guests. Then I will pose some questions to them. And then when we've gone through that, we're gonna open the floor up and you will be able to ask anything you would like. So it's a simple format. Uh, we will go till uh, four or 3.45, so a little over an hour, an hour and 10 minutes. And then we're going to take a break to go to the official ground healing ceremony. So let's get started. Let me just introduce, I'm gonna go in alphabetical order. They're not seated, sitting in alphabetical order, but let me start with my own colleague and dear friend, Deborah Burke, who is the Dean of Architecture. And one other thing that you won't know about her in all likelihood is that she's chair of the Design Architectural Committee for the uh, corporation for Yale University. So virtually all buildings at Yale have to go through this committee. And I will say Deborah was very helpful to us in this process. I'll never forget meeting in your New York office. So let me tell you just a brief bit. She was educated at Rhode Island School of Design with her Bachelor of Fine Arts and a Bachelor in Architecture and then years later an honorary doctorate. Uh, and she also went to City College of New York where she received a master's in urban planning and urban design. She founded Deborah Burke Partners, now Ken Burke, which is in New York City. She's built a number of well-known structures, the Cummings Distribution Headquarters in Indianapolis, Indiana. And for those of you that know architecture, you'll know there's a little town south of Indianapolis called Columbus. Indiana, and if you ever have a chance to go there, you should go there for the architecture. It's kind of like any architecture architect in the United States who somebody eventually has one of those structures and she has one, it was a bank. Uh, but I mean, the, the fabulous buildings of all sorts. She also helped uh, or designed the University of Pennsylvania meeting and guest house and the new residential colleges at Princeton University. She's won numerous awards, including in 2012, the inaugural recipient of the Berkeley Rupp Prize. This is at my alma mater, University of California, uh, given to an architect who has advanced the position of women and has emphasized sustainability and community in their work. She also won the association, or the architects, uh, let me get this straight yet, with the exact title of this. Uh, I think I wrote it out here. The American Institute of Architects, that's it. Um, ask a Topaz Medallion, which is the highest honor in architectural education for outstanding achievement. And just one last thing, she is the first woman to be dean of the Yale School of Architecture. So, <laughs> Deborah Burke. Sit, seated immediately to my left, to your right, as you're looking here, is Katie Dykes who's commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection Education. This is the State Department charged with conserving and improving Connecticut's natural resources and our environment. She has three Yale degrees, I'm very pleased to say. She has a bachelor's degree from Yale, an MA in history, and is a graduate of the law school from Yale. Uh, her first job was to be the deputy General Counsel for the White House Council on Environmental Quality and was the legal advisor to the U.S. Department of Energy. In 2012, she came back to Connecticut and joined the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection Education. She was first Deputy Commissioner for Energy, then Chair of the Connecticut Public Utilities Regulatory Authority, and in 2019, she became the Commissioner of that unit, and we're thrilled to have you with us, Katie. Thank you for joining me.
Again, in alphabetical order, Jason Jewhurst, who's a partner and principal of Bruner and Cott Architects. They are the main architectural firm for the Living Village. So uh, he knows a little bit about this. And since I've, this project has gone on for so long, when I first met Jason, he was a senior associate. Then he became a principal, and now he's a partner. So <laughs> <laughs> that will give you an idea of how long this is taken. He stayed with us the whole time, for which we are very grateful. He uh, was instrumental in building the Living Building Certified R.W. Kern Center at Hampshire College, which is just up the road from us. And I will say that this won the American Institute of Architects uh, Top 10 Award the year it was built. This is 2017. He's also won the Living Hero Award from the uh, International Living Futures Institute. Uh, so that's the organization that monitors and certifies living buildings. He's built a good number of other things. I'll just mention one, the Richard A. and Susan F. Smith Campus Center at Harvard University, which is a recent project of his. So would you join me in welcoming Jason Juher? <laughs> and, and just to give you an idea of how dedicated he's been, I was asked by Nancy Taylor, who's I'm sure here in the audience somewhere, to come speak at Old South Church, where she used to serve on uh, Earth Day one Sunday a number of years ago. And Jason came to the church. Uh, and I mean, that's going a little above and beyond what you would expect of an architect. But I've never forgotten your presence, Jason. Last but by no means least, our very own Julie Beth Zimmerman, who is vice provost for Yale Planetary Solutions and professor in the Department of Chemical and Environmental Engineering and in the School of the Environment, and their dean is sitting right there. Uh, she has her bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia, then her PhD from the University of Michigan, jointly from the School of Engineering and the School of Natural Resources and Environment. Her career started as a program manager and environmental engineer for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, so she and Katie has something in common uh, in terms of agencies, one national, one state. Uh, she began her academic career at the University of Virginia, then came to Yale in 2007, has worked her way through the ranks as assistant <laughs> associate, then full professor. That's not easy to do. Uh, she's also been drafted because she's so talented into administration. She was the Assistant Director for Research in the Center for Green Chemistry and Green Engineering. She's now Deputy Director. She won the Walter L. Huber Civil Engineering Prize for Innovative Research and Development of Sustainable Cost-Effective Technologies for the Treatment of Drinking Water. And that's quite important for our building project. Uh, in 2023, she became the first head of Yale Planetary Solutions and was appointed associate provost to head this up. Julie, we're thrilled you're with us. Thank you for all you do for Yale and for this project. All right, so when I said distinguished, I wasn't whistling Dixie. Um, now, first question. We, we're here, and all of us this year have an increased awareness of the rise in temperatures. This last summer was the hottest summer on record, at least according to NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Studies. It was 0.41, so four-tenths of a degree hotter than any other summer on record, and the record goes back to 1880. It was hot especially in August when the temperature was 2.2 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than the average for 19 50 to 1980. And if you want to put that in perspective, the best way to think of that is this was the coolest summer we're probably going to have had for the next 30 years. That's the way to think of that. So my question uh, to, I'll start with the two architects. So this is for uh, Deborah and Jason. Actually, we have three architects, but we'll start with them. Uh, as architects, both of you have been active in sustainability efforts in your specific projects and in your discipline. How seriously 
does the field of architecture as a whole take the need to make changes in built structures? What are the patterns that are happening? What are the kinds of discussions that are taking place? And what would you like to see happen? Deborah, you want to start? Well, great question. And um, architecture is taking it more seriously, but still not seriously enough. And I will say the following that I believe completely. If you practice architecture without concern for the environment, you are practicing unethically. That if we don't work on this, buildings contribute close to 40% of the world's carbon output. That's in how we operate them, heat them, cool them, take care of them. It's in how we build them and what we build them of. And it's in how we demolish them and what we do with the refuse because we very cavalierly tear down buildings all, all the time despite all the embedded energy within them. So I would say the profession as a whole and most practitioners are paying attention and I think people like Jason and I and Eric sitting over there uh, are doing all we can to speed up the, in, the thought in this matter and to make it vastly, I would almost say make it mandatory that, this is, that buildings are looked at with a clear eye to sustainability and the nature of their footprint. And I'll also say this because I'm old enough to remember when you know, solar houses were ugly and people thought that sustainable architecture meant living in a yurt that um, buildings that uh, have the appropriate respect for what we need to do to save the planet can also be beautiful. And that too is a social justice issue. So uh, yes, all around, but this is what we need to be doing and it's what we are starting to do as a profession. Jason, you wanna add something to that? Can everyone hear me? Um, I wholly agree. <laughs> uh, but to set the perspective a little bit, so just in the United States, we're 5% of the world's population, but 30% of emissions. Now, we have the technology, we have the innovations, but we have to continue to rapidly push the rest of the market. Because we're in this situation where we can innovate fast and like you said, transform the marketplace, but also think more ethically. And as you mentioned earlier this year at a, at a national conference, Greg, it's a moral imperative as well. It's part of the work to learn how to do this the right way by pushing the boundaries on what performance can be and decarbonizing buildings, period. That's buildings around us and buildings that haven't been designed yet. It's both. It's saving buildings, and because we're 30% of the world's emissions and only 5% of the population, the pressure's on us to lead. And I think we're seeing it happening. We're, we're hearing conversations that have, that have been taken place over the last five years, and in the, in the, certainly in the profession of architecture, but it's also now happening at the dinner table. It's happening at the town hall. It's happening at the state level. It's happening in the government conversations about water scarcity, energy security, costs of rising prices, pick a, pick a utility. It's not going to trend down. They're all going to go up. So we, again, we have the technology to do um, amazing things, but we have to work earnestly to do that. And I think... Um, as it'll be a theme that reoccurs, I think, actually, in the next hour. But I would say that the biggest conversation, and, I, and, I, and we haven't talked about this in the last couple of weeks, but over the last few months, the amount of existing buildings and the role that they play, because it's about designing new buildings, it's about having an example like the Living Village, but it's also saving the historic structures all around us and making them part of the solution. And that's, that's the other 40%. So even new buildings, high emissions to, to put them in. It's very intense on the environment. We're trying to do that lighter, but really what we have is opportunities in front of us and propel them, give them rebirth, move them forward. And yes, not every building is savable, but they should all be carefully considered and move forward with that larger goal in mind. Just a few points. 
All right, thank you. Do, do Katie or Julie, do you want to add anything? I mean, you're free to. Well, I'll just jump in to say, um, I love that we're starting off looking at the global scale in terms of, I mean, the building sector contribution to greenhouse gas emissions is a big chunk of the pie that needs to get addressed. And I often get asked this question, what does it matter if Connecticut, a small state, three, three million plus people, um, is leading on addressing climate emissions because uh, from the building sector because we're just such a small piece of that pie. And if we even zoom even closer in, what does it matter if Yale leads or if this particular building demonstrates what's achievable in the vast scheme of all the emissions and all the buildings that we need to tackle? Um, and I'll say that, you know, I think the, the reason this matters so much um, is because what you're accomplishing here with the Living Village is signaling what's possible in design, um, and it's also communicating values. And I'm a bit biased as a Yale alum, but we know that Yale is such a significant place nationally, globally. And when this university, even though it's uh, relatively on the planetary scale, small number of people um, who pass through these doors, but how Yale communicates its values, right? Um, including, and especially in the built environment, in these amazing structures, um, really matters and makes an impression. I was an undergraduate, and uh, when I came to Yale from, uh, from West Virginia, it was my first time above the Mason-Dixon line, you know, visiting um, as a prefresh, and I was imagining I was gonna be in, you know, uh, like Dead Poet Society, sort of gothic, you know. <laughs> I, and then I found out I was assigned to Morse College, and I was a little bit disappointed um, until I realized at the end of four years what an amazing architectural experience I had had um, and how it had affected me in ways that I probably still couldn't articulate. Uh, and I think about the students and the professors and the community members who are going to uh, be passing through this building and this structure and what um, values uh, this, um, this new facility will be communicating. And I think that that's where um, Connecticut is a leader and Yale is a leader in communicating values. That matters a lot um, for how we're demonstrating what's possible and instilling um, this vision of not just reducing emissions, um, but also um, doing so in a way that is healing communities, bringing people together, um, uh, valuing uh, uh, beauty and comfort and safety. Um, that's so powerful. Uh, and I think that's a, a part of, you know, as we're designing policies, we often spend a lot of time, not so much with architects, but a lot with economists doing cost benefit analysis and, and that sort of thing. But bringing, I think that the, uh, I love to be part of this discussion with um, leaders in the architecture space because I think you are, the art that you practice is about bringing all those values together. And that's what's so exciting about this event today. Thank you, Julie. Did you? Want to weigh in? I'll just add one more point as Yale's leading, and I think this project in particular is not just the select few and the amazing people who get to walk through Yale, but what are the lessons that we learn from this building and from your practice that we can share with others? What works? How is it working? What are the benefits of this? Can we capture these co-benefits? Um, and what is the story we can tell that other people can learn from? And I think the other thing to think about is it is a building, but it is integrated into a campus and thinking about what are all the interconnections that this building brings and what does it afford in terms of what are up here on Science Hill of energy and how we integrate into a larger built environment. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I'm going to say since Deborah mentioned him, the design architects that worked as sub-architects under Brunner and Cott are sitting right up here. Haller and Yoon, Eric and, uh, is up at uh, Harvard, and his wife is a dean of Columbia. Cornell. Cornell <laughs> School of Design, sorry. Cornell, so just raise your hand so people will know, but there are the design architects for the Living Village, and it is beautiful. They did a great job. Uh, so thank you for being here. Let's turn to the standards just and ask a couple of questions. Um, most everybody is familiar with LEED standards. And when I first came as dean, I knew about LEED standards. That, that was, you know, silver, gold, platinum. Um, I'd never heard of the Living Building Challenge at that point. Um, and I know that it's, it had a, a start 
in the United States Green Building Council. That is, it was Jason McLennan was working for a firm and he designed the Living Building Challenge as a way of going beyond LEED uh, standards. And he actually offered it to the United States Green Building Council for a dollar. And they declined to buy it. So he gave it to Cascadia and the rest is history, as they say. I mean, it's, it's become the International uh, Living Futures Institute. And the CEO of that is here today, uh, sitting right back in the back. And we're very pleased to have uh, Cynthia Baker with us today. So thank you for joining us. Um, Let me, let me ask this. Do you envision the Living Building Challenge, and this is kind of a hard question for me to even ask, but do you envision it as a sustainable standard for other buildings? Because I'll, I'll just put my cards on the table. I think of this as throwing a gauntlet down in front of other universities and colleges saying, you can do this, now rise to the occasion. But... Uh, honest answer, do you, do you view it as a sustainable uh, standard or what would you like to see? It, it's obviously someday going to be superseded and, and there will be something that's much better. But for now, it's the most advanced that we have. So um, why don't we start, Katie, uh, do you want to take a stab at that since you worry about the state of Connecticut? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this is, what's really remarkable about the standard and, and, you know, comparing to the LEED rating program is that it's not just focusing on doing less harm, but also fixing the damage, right? And, and what's um, really interesting to me uh, is the emphasis on not just um, addressing, again, the economics and, uh, you know, reducing, reducing the emissions and being... Um, uh, carbon neutral and so on and so forth in the way we think about measuring energy consumption and usage and so on. But it's also reflecting health and happiness, um, looking at justice and equity, um, focusing on safety, uplifting the human spirit. I'll, I'll give you, I'll let you in on a little secret. We have, you know, a couple major sectors that we have to tackle to address greenhouse gas emissions. One is the power sector, right? Power plants, transmission lines, things that um, most people don't think about on the everyday. Uh, then we need to address transportation emissions. And so there you see that conversation pushing when we're talking about biking and walking and electric vehicles and so on. Buildings is the, is the, the other major sector that we have to tackle. And in some ways it's the hardest uh, because the diversity of different types of buildings that are out there, just in terms of their age, in terms of how we use them, who's using them, who owns them, all of the different elements within, from the insulation to your washer and dryer, uh, lighting, it, there's so much heterogeneity. And there are so many people that have to be involved in the decision-making process about whether to upgrade um, and how to address them. If you put all the people in the room that need to be involved in deter making decisions around power plants and transmission lines, it just is like a tiny fraction of people compared to the commercial and industrial and, and uh, residential buildings um, and all the folks involved in those decisions. So what that says to me is, um, we know that economics and savings, right, these being able to reduce emissions, reduce building energy usage is a motivator um, for many people um, in thinking about the investments that they're making in buildings. But for the vast majority of people, I think, it's some of these other values, ultimately, um, that are going to be the major drivers of taking action and pri prioritizing more sustainable approaches. And those priorities include things that are hard to measure, but are so important. Safety, health, right? Community, connection. Um, what, you know, the, they are, um, and, they, and they are notoriously difficult for policymakers <laughs> to figure out how to tap into those motivations. But we hear it all the time, whether it's from a business owner who wants to have um, a communal space for uh, making sure that their workforce can connect and share ideas to uh, a tenant 
um, who's concerned about their child who has asthma and exposure to, to mold or to lead paint. These are huge issues um, in a lot of the building stock here in New Haven and across the state. Um, and it's though, if, so to have a standard that can speak to those very human values of individuals and communities um, gives me a lot of optimism um, that standards like this will appeal um, to uh, motivations and uh, of all these vast numbers of decision makers that are going to be presented with choices over the next uh, several years about things they can do to help reduce emissions. Okay, thank you. Jason, I'm going to ask you, because this is your second living building challenge project, and I, and I guess let me rephrase the question slightly. Is this going to be a boutique example of what can be done that where you have a trickle-down effect for others, or do you see this as something that can be replicated, uh, maybe not every house, I'm not suggesting that, but on enough buildings that it actually becomes pretty significant. Yeah, it's a great question. And <clears throat> so I do think it's a sustainable standard that we should push. Um, but the first part I want to touch on is actually I think the, it's the first time a building standard advocacy and philosophy um, tool that starts to reawaken how we might have lived a long time ago. We were connected to when the sun rose. You moved into the sun when you wanted to be in it. You knew when the ocean tides changed. You knew when the wind and the seasons moved. You kind of understood. You had a deeper connection to where you were in the world. And in a way, our team, over 75 professionals working on this project, we all had to put ourselves in those shoes to think a little deeper about what it means to live in this climate, in this city, on this hill, in this neighborhood. And I think that's different than a certification uh, checklist. Now, LEED has done something that no other program has done before. It got everybody thinking the same way about sustainability across the United States. And I know that it also has reach in, uh, across the globe as well. This is the next step. It sort of brings together both halves of the brain in my mind, where if you can design buildings that are both beautiful, they tell stories, they bring people closer to where they're from or where they live, that will just be positive. That's a, that's a better outcome than buildings that maybe don't pay attention or having people who live in them or work in them that also don't have a connection to, the, to, the na to their um, environment. The second part is, I think, Greg, you need beacons that show how this can happen before it's cost effective before regulations have caught up, before government and agencies have figured out how to connect public and private um, resources for, for water use and energy use, you need beacons that push the boundaries and test it. and make It, it, it is supposed to be difficult um, because we're charting territory that's not been charted before. And I think when you do it on a scale, that beacon just becomes much brighter. I do think the innovations and, and the thought process and the outcomes, because the LBC, the Living Building Challenge is all about outcomes. What is your annual energy usage at the end of the project? And does your community understand it? What's your annual usage of water? Do you know what you use your water for? And do you understand how that water became potable? Those are the lessons that we want to carry through, I think, our culture. Now, we've forgotten them. We used to know them very well. But now, we're trying to reawaken those ideas into our architecture. But when you bring that together with design, and you have places and architecture that speaks a language that is tied to its environment, it's tied to its climate, that's the takeaway that we want children to learn in, people to work in, and students and, and, and communities to live in. So I do think it's both. I mean, it's not really answering your question, which is it? But I say it's both, because yeah. you do need to look to the example and say, man, I bet they got it 80% correct, but we're always going to be learning from those processes, and then apply that to how you can on different scales. I, I wanna, is 
this on? I have no idea. That. Thank you. Um, I want to add something because I am a huge believer in the living building standard or the living building challenge, depending on which version of the name you use. And I think it's fantastic, Greg, that you and your team of architects, as well as the university, are doing this. It's absolutely fabulous. And Yale should be, as has been said, a role model. But I do not want to diminish any other standard because I think if a public school in a small town without a lot of funding establishes lead silver, God bless. That is really important. And we have to build it into everything we do. And maybe in five years, they'll get to lead gold. And in five years, the living building standard will also have changed. To me, the real issue on all of these things is that it has to be a must that we don't turn back on that. When the project comes in over budget, the first thing you don't cross out are all the expenses associated with having the building be responsible to the globe, to the climate, to the people who live in it. That is where I think the real risk is. Like this stuff cannot be cut out. It is a must and you should aim as high as you possibly can but you shouldn't allow yourself to step back so i think we really have to think about it in everything we build the example i'll use is when they passed the american with disabilities acts the first thing we did was put nasty little ramps on the back of buildings that somebody made out of two by fours from home depot and they didn't look very good and they treated people who had difficulty getting into buildings differently than people who could get them in the normal way. That is no longer acceptable, and we now do universal accessibility in everything we build. And what I think we have to aim for is universal climate responsibility in everything we build, and everybody has to aim as high as they possibly can and not be allowed to slip back from that when the going gets tough. Okay, thank you. Uh, Julie, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I'll just add a couple of things. I think you all alluded to this, but these standards are evolving and continue to change. And so I think as long as we recognize that there is not just meeting the standard and stopping, but this idea of continuous improvement and that the standards will move and we need to move and continue to be challenged as we go forward, um, I think that we need to think about that as Yale, as a society. Oh. We need to think about that as a society and as a university, that this is a dynamic system. And then building on what you were saying, I think the other part we think about is the more people are connected to the environment, the more they take that with them into their daily lives. And so by living in buildings such as the Living Village, they will think differently when they go do whatever work it is they do. And so the more we can have people connected, the better chance we have of actually having a sustainable future because people will think differently. And I think that's a big advantage of these buildings. Yeah, thank you. I will just say the first time I went into the Bullet Center in Seattle, which is the first major corporate building that has the Living Building Challenge standard, I was standing, I think, on the fourth floor. Dennis Hayes, who's the first uh, director of Earth Day, helped found it, was there, and Jason McLennan and I were talking, and all of a sudden, this is all controlled by computers. Our, ours will not be this uh, technologically advanced. There's a little more money. But all of a sudden, one side of the building, the shades came down, and the other side, the, the shades went up, and the windows opened because the sun had moved in the sky, and the building was reacting to it, and you could actually feel the building breathe uh, the, with the flow of air. And I thought, okay, now I get why it's called a living building. Uh, but I think the people who live in it will have to do those things. And, and so it's not quite the same as just walking into a regular building, throwing on the light switch and the, changing the thermostat. There's, there's a whole lot more thought that will go into it. I, I want to ask another, well, I view this as a difficult question, uh, but maybe you won't, um, but I think it's a question we should ask. So Yale uses lead gold as the standard, which, and as Deborah has just said, I think that's laudable. I don't want to criticize. Okay. okay, all right, all right. Well, this is going to be my question, and, and Julie, I'm going to start with you and then ask Deborah to weigh in because you two are both tied to Yale, and Katie, you can feel free as an alum if you want. <laughs> but uh, I, 
I guess my question is this. We have an ambitious goal of being carbon free, and we're would like to move that date up a little bit. And there have been ch all kinds of changes in the discussions about that. But my question is, is gold lead an adequate standard for Yale? And secondly, what can we do about all of the old buildings that we have, which are not um, environmentally friendly and will be incredibly expensive to address. So uh, that, that's my question. I see Ben Pollock, who was the provost sitting back there, and I'm thinking, now that'd be a good question for Ben, because he's an economist. <laughs> but Julie and Deborah, what do, you, what do you think? So I would say, I mean, as we have said, lead gold is a great standard to start from, but we should not stop there. It's not enough. Um, Yale does have a goal of being carbon um, zero by 2050, truly without offsets. That is a challenging goal for us to meet. There's a little bit of the grid gets cleaner and there's some technology changes and then there's some really big things that need to happen in terms of behavior change and how we use and operate and interact with our buildings. Um, I think some of this gets to what Katie was saying and that this isn't the building in and of itself, it's part of a system and what is powering it. And Yale is doing a lot of work now to build out geothermal, to build out new power sources so that we can have energy and have the buildings perform and operate without having that impact on the environment. I think the other thing to think about is that, you know, you kind of alluded to this when you said, oh, we have to live in a yurt. And it is asking people to sacrifice, asking for less, asking buildings to do less, expecting less, wanting less. And we as Yale need to figure out how do we say, you can have more performance, you can have better functioning buildings, you can have a better experience in that building because it is built to these sustainability standards. And so I think we need to change a mindset of reduction, of, of less, of minimize, to how do we maximize, how do we think about performance in a very different way with a much broader definition. Thank you. Deborah, do you wanna? Yeah. I Julie and I had a meeting earlier today and we discovered we're on the same wavelength on, on almost everything. So we might be a little bit redundant uh, when we speak to this. And I interrupted you by saying that I don't think that the lead gold standard is high enough for an institution like Yale, but it's a good baseline for all institutions as we keep working in this direction. But I wanna answer uh, or speak to a question you raised about the performance of legacy buildings. So point one is going to be that the, foot, the carbon footprint of tearing them down and rebuilding them is greater than using them and slowly retrofitting them. So that's part one. Part two is to what Julie was saying is to demand of people that we expand their comfort tolerances, shall we say. You don't need a room to be 65 degrees in the summer and you don't need a room to be 75 degrees in the winter, right? You can wear a sweater or put on a sleeveless outfit to accommodate temperature alone. And the third thing we should look at at a university, and this will make Ben Pollock smile, is when we heat a room, whether to 65 degrees or 75 degrees, and it's empty 70% of the time, we are just burning fuel unnecessarily. So efficiency in the facilities we have and asking ourselves whether we always need, you need to build new because you want to house more students, but do we really need to constantly build knew when we could use better what we already have is a question that any major organization should be asking itself about its facilities uh, because efficiency matters as well. Thank you, Jason. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think there is, well, it's also about setting expectations. And I think when you think about how many of you think really carefully about how you feel and then how much energy it costs to bring your room to that temperature. Probably one, the first part of that you probably think a lot about, and if you pay your, you definitely, if you pay your bills for the heating and cooling, you think about the second question. But when I think about a university at, you know, arrangement, um, it's very different. So who's in control of the temperature setting and who's in control of making, you know, what is comfort in defining that? But I, I will say, 
in the experience, and I'm sure this is similar, that once you have the conversation and provide a feedback loop that helps educate and, learn, and they can learn, I can tell you nobody wants to use more energy per square foot than the other person because we're all naturally competitive in that way to be more efficient. Once you understand what that does, what, what's the cause, so the root cause, but again, it's tying it to human behavior. And what I've found, in, and I'll talk about Yale for a second because I think there's been some great discussions about changing the standard or augmenting the standard on campus. I mean, the Living Village is, is, is a model of that. That wouldn't have been possible maybe 10 years ago. We didn't have the pathways to approve a project on campus the way this project was worked through the corporation and the design review and all of the performance that was discussed throughout the design process. When I think about how people work and how institutions work, the common commonality between progress, progression is providing a feedback loop and educating the impacts. Because once you are aware, you can't forget. Right? You can't forget that, man, if I left my light on all night or if I left the water faucet dripping over the weekend because I was afraid for something to happen if it, for it to freeze, which if you live in New England, that's a, that's a normal thing. You do that in the dead of the winter so, you don't, so your pipes don't freeze you start to attach the value that that cost or the value of that resource, they think differently about it. And I, I'm not saying everybody is at the same pace, but I do think that positive exchange of really thinking about how you're using energy, how you're using water, how you're, using, how do you, how you're making waste, and then being connected to those outcomes. Because at the end of it, I put my trust in, I think people make the better choice. When given the opportunity with the information and the facts, they will do better to improve. May not get there on day one, but they'll try. And I think that's a big part of having these experiments of projects that are trying to do things that haven't been done before. And I think it also comes to, we're gonna to have to dig deep and think carefully about the, built, the buildings that are around us because they're part of the equation. As, as Deborah said, and as we're talking about, we can't just start over. So we're working with that entire sort of, it's an ethos of buildings both haven't been built yet, but then also becoming more efficient about how we use the, the spaces we have. I'm gonna zoom out it, a little bit because this same discussion about um, new versus retrofits, we could be in a staff meeting <laughs> um, at, or in a, in a hearing at the legislature um, because these are things we're talking about all the time. Connecticut, we're a very, you know, a state that has some very old building stock and we don't have a lot of new construction um, going in relative to other parts of the country. We're also, I think, the fourth densest state in terms of the number of people um, per square mile in our, in our uh, midst. Um, and because we've built out so much of our small uh, area. And so, um, so there's not really a possibility for us to meet our, our goals. We have a state wide target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050 um, and 45% by 2030. And we can't get there without a plan for addressing retrofitting that building stock, some of which goes back, way back. So, um, you know, and we have these debates all the time because we're often trying to advocate for adopting more stringent building codes and we hear from the home builders that, you know, that's putting more cost and burden and making new construction that's more sustainable, more expensive relative to um, existing building stock that's not addressed. And then when we have been pushing things to try to provide for more labeling and disclosure, so for renters and, and uh, folks purchasing existing homes, that they know more about those systems and what it'll cost to heat and cool, we get a lot of pushback from realtors saying, don't, and landlords saying, don't do that. Um, there's a lot of fear there about how people might react. But at the end of the day, having a template for what, what the, a, a building system looks like that has been, you know, starting from scratch, envisioned in a way to uh, maximize for efficiency in water use, in materials, um, in energy use, it informs the kinds of decisions um, and identifying what your options are and how to make those decisions for retrofits. Most people in the middle of the winter, if your furnace kicks, kicks it, right, it's not a good time for you to start having an educational process about heat pumps. 
you're just going to call the HVAC guy and you're going to get whatever is on the truck. <laughs> Let alone starting to think about how you could size those heat pumps differently if you had solar on your roof or if you had um, insulation in your walls, which is like amazing how little insulation we have um, in our building stock in Connecticut. So, you know, the more we can do to sort of educate and help people think through how these systems work together when they're designed um, effectively and new construction built to these standards does that, the more we can help people be more thoughtful about the types of decisions they want to be prepared to make um, when you know there's the systems in their existing buildings fail. The last thing I want to say um, is that if you look at the age of the building stock here in Connecticut, of course, a lot of our oldest buildings are also in our urban centers um, and in communities that um, have some of the highest rates of poverty and, and environmental justice uh, challenges. And so um, it's really important that we have a plan for addressing and retrofitting that building stock to revitalize our city centers. Not only to reduce emissions and provide for equity and affordability um, for the inhabitants of environmental justice communities, but also because sprawl, right, is contributing to more driving, which means more emissions in the transportation sector. We know we've made vast strides in improving the fuel efficiency of vehicles. We're working as we speak to try to get the legislature to approve adopting the California emission standards for vehicles so we can go to um, all clean vehicles by 2035, um, call your legislator. But, um, but we know that a lot of those, uh, in order to get where we need to in reducing emissions from transportation, um, we, we actually aren't bending down the curve of emissions unless we reduce vehicle miles traveled because people are actually driving more with their fuel efficient vehicles. And that comes back to the built environment. Buildings are the solution there too. So being able to um, have transit oriented development and, and retrofit and revitalize city centers and existing buildings is key to actually reducing emissions in the transportation sector too. Thank you, thank you all very much. I, I wanna say just one brief word. I've recognized a couple people in the audience um, but one of the people at Yale who has to worry about this in a very direct way is J. Mike Bellamy. And he's been a great supporter of the Living Village. He's the vice president for facilities. He's sitting in the very back. I can see him back there. Uh, J. Mike, thank you. So, Katie, you've touched on something that I did want to ask all of you, and this is a broad question, but we worry a great deal about social justice at the Divinity School. And I'm deeply concerned about the challenges that we will face. And I'll give you one illustration along these lines with our environment. So I worry about the water line of the sound and the water level in the sound. And I think about the low lying areas in Bridgeport or New Haven, which are principally occupied by people who are, let's just say, don't have the same level of resources that we have sitting up here on this panel. So if we lived there and we were threatened by water, we would sell our homes, even at a loss, move somewhere else and have a different place to live. They can't afford to sell their home. They, they, they can't buy something else. So that's one illustration. You don't have to take that one but I would like for you to expand on, from your vantage point where you're working, what are the ways that we need to be thinking about the issue of social justice, and especially with the built environment, uh, which is our topic today. What, what ideas do you have? What, what do you see that you find useful and hopeful? I'll be quick. This is hard, and there's a lot to say. Um, First off, I'm very hopeful because for the first time we have an enormous amount of funding that's coming to our state and all 50 states um, as a result of the Biden administration and our congressional delegation's effort to pass the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. $100 million coming to Connecticut for solar. Um, rooftop solar predominantly focused on multifamily um, housing in environmental justice communities to help lower bills. Um, we will have over $100 million in rebates coming to help low-income families be able to retrofit their homes to lower their energy use, which provides for greater comfort 
health and safety and, and uh, affordability. Um, and in addition, to, that's all on top of many of the programs that we've had in place for the last two decades, thanks to the Connecticut legislature um, and uh, gubernatorial leadership in having energy efficiency programs like Energy ICT and, and so on um, that have been uh, providing that baseline of investment and in efficiency for so long. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel like we have an opportunity to really make a dent um, in a way that we haven't been able to before. At the same time, um, people are really waking up and demanding these services. We saw a 45% increase in the number of folks taking advantage of the state's energy efficiency programs during the pandemic, and it stayed high in part because people are seeing more volatile electric bills and electric pricing, um, and so that's a good thing to the extent that it's motivating people to take advantage of some of these um, improvements to their building stock. Um, so, and we that's enabled us to double down on our focus on helping um, vulnerable communities, helping uh, communities that are struggling with uh, affordability, and and so and there's a lot of amazing work going on here in, in New Haven um, and across the state in that regard. The thing, um, we've talked about those different motivators in addition to lowering energy bills because Connecticut has some of the highest energy costs in the nation. Um, we're still heating with things like diesel fuel. That's what heating oil is, by the way. <laughs> uh, and, uh, um, and and aging building, aged building stock, and we have significant portion of our, our population um, that is paying more than 6% of their um, monthly income in energy costs, which is the benchmark for unaffordability. Uh, and we know that that's a major contributor to people losing their homes um, uh, and, and having other you know, credit challenges and so on. It's just not the ability to pay. Um, so we're taking a lot of action to address that. Um, and, and it's helping to address other issues around health and safety, addressing mold, lead, asbestos, cold, code violations, other things that are barriers to people even being able to get a contractor to come into their home um, to be able to do energy efficiency work. Um, so we've been, for the first time with the American Rescue Plan, we were able to get funding to start a program to address those code violations, those pre-weatherization barriers, um, which is something that's rarely ever funded and a major barrier for um, equitable access to these programs. Um, so that's helping. Um, and uh, and I'm, ex I'm going to be excited to look back on this, this time, you know, 2023 and the next few years and how we're spending these dollars working together with leaders like Mayor Elliker um, and Yale is playing such an important role here in, in New Haven to address those challenges. At the same time, though, we, um, uh, we know that the cl climate, is, climate change is accelerating and we're seeing those impacts now playing out in our communities. And it's not just sea level rise, um, it's also heat island effects. New Haven is uh, one of the communities in um, the, the state that has some of the lowest levels of tree cover um, in uh, certain census tracts. Um, it's, there's huge disparities between St. Ronan Street and being in the Hill neighborhood um, and the lack of tree cover itself can contribute to having temperatures that may be several degrees higher in certain neighborhoods of this city. Um, uh, and if we see prolonged uh, uh, heat waves, that can be a huge challenge. That comes back to buildings. If we have more affordable and, and better insulated homes and more affordable cooling, that becomes a health and safety and climate resilience um, measure to help people withstand more unpredictable weather. Same with flooding, um, as you think about how we're managing, um, you know, last year it was a drought. Uh, this year it's intense rainstorms um, that have, uh, back, you know, created huge challenges for homeowners and business owners um, and communities such as in the north end of Hartford that are experiencing sewer backups in their, in their homes. So it's accelerating. Um, and, and so we're working really hard to deliver on, you know, all these different improvements to buildings are not only good for reducing emissions from energy use, but they're also helping to make uh, uh, buildings more safe um, and more resilient to the impacts of climate change. And that matters not just for the people living in those buildings. It also matters for the health of our communities and our cities, because remember, a lot of how our municipalities are funding critical services, think about the education, school, investments in schools, investments in roads, investments in public services. It's coming from property taxes, which are assessed based on the grand list. And the grand list is tied to the value, the assessed value of your building stock. So if our buildings are not able to be retrofitted or designed to withstand these climate impacts, we are undermining our, the ability of our communities to invest in the other critical services for our thriving. 
Maybe that sounded negative. Let's turn it to positive. <laughs> All of the things that we're doing are not to, to reduce emissions can, are also having the potential to make our buildings more safe and more resilient, which contributes not only to uh, wealth creation and retention for building owners, but also for communities that are providing critical services. And that's more important than ever in uh, many of our city centers and environmental justice communities. So I'm really excited about what we're doing, including with federal funding to help that. Thank that wasn't you. fast, yeah. but there's so yeah. much happening. Yeah. Well, I, Deborah, I'm going to ask you, I know that in architecture you have a number of things that you do as a school to try to address this, but I'm, I'm also wondering if you can, just as a, as a major architect in the United States, think more broadly as well and talk about what you see as some of the major challenges that we need to address along these lines. You can start with your school if you want, but I'm asking you to go beyond the School of Architecture. Yeah, no, I'm going to start beyond the School of Architecture and, may, and maybe bring it back in. And I'm going to go back several decades to say that for way too long, the American approach to building was most space at least cost. Very bad approach in every possible way, in how we treated labor, in where we got our materials, in how we took care of things. I think the mindset we need to have is the right amount of space at an appropriate cost. And to also recognize that cost, and I'm not an economist, so this is more from the gut, that cost isn't just what it costs per square foot on either the day you put it out to bid or the day you cut the ribbon, but what it costs in five years or 15 years or 25 years when people don't have housing, or the schools are uninhabitable, or the roads are no longer drivable because they're underwater. In other words, what does it cost over the long haul to continue to build the way we have been building? And the lesson is we have to change how we build. So if I bring it back to my school, it is that every project, no matter whether you're designing a library in Colorado for a college or uh, you know, refugee housing, which we're working on now in uh, Bangladesh actually, uh, that whatever the students are looking at, it has to be what I would call broadly speaking, built environment social justice. It has to pay attention to the climate crisis, to the humanity, the crisis, um, humanity crisis, I guess it's right to be in a divinity school talking about this, our responsibility to other humans and other living beings across this entire planet. Every building needs to pay attention to that. I'm sorry I'm not as articulate as Katie is, but I feel this stuff so passionately that it's kind of spilling out of me, uh, not so well processed. But we ask of our students that they think about every facet of what a building does through its design, construction, and presence in the world going forward, because buildings last for a very long time, uh, as a whole view of their responsibility, not just as architects, but as humans. Thank you. You know what? I, I'm looking at the clock, and I realize we have 15 minutes left, and I need to let the audience ask some questions. So, uh, Indy, you've got the first question. If you Is that your hand? Yes, okay. You've got the first, and, uh, oh, uh, yes, thank you. And then I think back in the corner, I saw a hand, yes. Okay, Indy, you're first. So mine is for Julie. Through your new lens of looking at the whole university, which parts of the university mission are the most challenging with respect to building sustainably to meet our mission? It's interesting, as I've only been here for three weeks, but going around and listening to what everybody was saying about um, you know, what we need to do for retrofitting, what we need to do for energy efficiency is actually workforce, is actually having the people who are trained and prepared to take on this work who are in the community and of the community. So you talk about environmental justice and what we do for the people who live in these buildings. And it solves this problem for this building. But if we think about going after something like workforce development, we are now training people. We are giving them livelihood. We are changing intergenerational wealth. And we are able to have staff and people who are prepared to do energy efficiency projects, whether at Yale or within these communities. So I think the interesting part for Yale is to start 
to look across what have historically been silos or divisions and say, where are there synergies? Where if we do this one action, we make this one investment, we get many benefits in many areas for the university. And so it's really getting across the campus to find those synergies. After my month, I would say Yale is a loose confederation of states. <laughs> and I'd like to figure out how to be the EU layer of, you may still be your country, but let's find some commonality across. Where are those synergies? And I think workforce development is a really interesting opportunity for the university to hit belonging, to bring new innovation and new technologies from the university and to address our relationships with the city of New Haven and local economic development in solving environmental justice and meeting our carbon goals. Thank you, Talitha. Thank you. I'm, uh, my name is Talitha Arnold, graduate 1980 from YDS, serve a local church in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And we've gone through four building projects in the time that I've been there. My question is, how, does, how will the Living Village help educate YDS students to be able to serve better the congregations they're, se they're serving whether they're involved in new building or in retrofitting or other kinds of things. How does living in the, the living village be an educational tool for equipping people who may not have architectural background or environmental background, but be able to work with congregations to do what all of you are talking about? It's absolutely crucial, um, but how does, how does the Living Village Project engage that question? I'll take that one. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. And I would say, um, so thinking now about how this project has evolved over the last eight, almost 10 years, um, it's really focused on connecting people back to not just where they live, where they're situated, but also connecting them to the resources that they, that they, that they get. And when, we have, when we talk about resources, we talk about waste generation, water, energy, food. Where does the food come from? So when we think about the programs that will happen at Living Village and what are happening at the Kern Center, which is what I'm seeing with, through these projects, and it happens on many other types of uh, projects that also have a mission to teach through architecture, there will be feedback loops for the students and faculty and staff to understand how much energy they're using they'll also know how much they're generating. So when you connect those two dots, that's one sort of intelligence that you can carry with you as, a, as someone living here. It's also gonna be focused on the water. So thinking about, so when there's a drought, as we had last year, very different this year, not only the buildings, but the systems and the landscape will reflect that. So there's a careful attention to making sure that not just the architecture tells the stories, and, sh and reveals how we're living within a climate, but it's also flowing through the landscape. So for example, this landscape on a summer like we've had will be very green, it will likely be overgrown, and it will have lots and lots of water flowing through it a lot of the time. If it's like last year, they will be dry, there will be different vegetation for that because it's dry, and there will be less water moving on the site. When you live in that environment, you'll take that with you. There's a whole host of other programs that are more didactic, that'll be connected to your cell phone, that'll be connected to your daily lives. But through the programs within the Living Village, the idea is that they can model or learn new behaviors through living here because they're connected to the resources that they're using. It's not magic when you turn on the faucet, the Living Village. You're gonna know how much you're using. It's not magic how long your shower is and how great it was and how hot the water was without you thinking about how much that impacted your energy use for your suite or for your floor. So again, it's bringing that information and, and really having a tight feedback loop. Because if you could see it, if it's posted on the wall, if it's in comparison to another room, people will pay attention. So those are just some examples of how you can take that right out of real life and it sometimes is that simple. And we don't have, as Greg mentioned, we do not have automatic shades that roll up. But we will have students with warm rooms if they forget to close their windows. Or they'll be cold and wet 
depending on the season. So again, it's reconnecting, almost just awakening ourselves to what it means to live in New England at the top of watershed, which is a higher responsibility, by the way. We're thinking about all of the land below us. We're at the top of watershed. So we have a higher calling to make sure that any water that goes into the ground is the highest quality possible, and we're using as little of it as we, as we need to so that we can put it back into the ground in a managed way. Getting back to your other question, Greg, about how do you begin to teach, and we have a lot of low-lying neighborhoods. Well, let's, lo let's lessen the burden on those low-lying neighborhoods with how much we use and how much we put back in. So those are just some of the examples, but it's a great question, and it's gonna change and evolve. That's also I could say. What could be more religious than guilt and shame? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it, it's certainly a tested method of behavior I, change. I saw the hand in the corner. There, thank you. Well, thanks for bringing up the landscape. Have, we've been talking mostly about the, the building, but have landscape architects weighed in on how the building will, because it's got to, it's got to have an oak tree or something there to, uh, to decarbonize as well. You're absolutely correct. So there is a sequestration program that the landscape is acting uh, for the project, and it will. We're going we're gonna to be able to talk about how the reseeded and also rehabilitated landscape, because as if you don't know, much of this is glacial till. And glacial till doesn't filter water very well, and it doesn't grow a lot of very lush landscapes if it's that close to the surface, which this site happens to be. So a lot of soil, and as Greg will know, and anybody that's worked in the project, there's a lot of resources coming to the site to help drain it, to help filter it back into the site, help treat the water ecologically through the landscape, but then also to create outdoor spaces that are as... Um, as important in teaching somebody what it means to live in New England through those systems. So sequestration, drainage on site, retaining the storm water, the landscape is a robust organism of its own um, working on the site. And actually, I would say of the four and a half acres, my hope is that the memories that people have here, it's both of where they live, but it's also where they were outside. And it's, it, 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 it's connected to that life on campus. And Yale and so many other universities across the, the U.S. have these beautiful landscapes. Some of them are arboretums. And this will be another example of creating spaces that has a deeper meaning to not just being beautiful and being an arboretum, which is a wonderful space to be, but it will also be a highly functional and critically integral to that quality of space, but also in filtering the water and helping the landscape sort of renew itself. And there'll be a lot of things that we're gonna learn over the next, there's not a landscape like this on campus, I can promise you. But we're, gonna, we're excited to see how this landscape will take shape and the landscape architects that we've worked with, Andrew Pogon um, out of Philadelphia, um, have worked on so many major projects throughout the United States that are doing just that. They're working landscapes that are also beautifully designed. It, okay, we have a we have two more questions, and we're going to have to, three more, I guess. We'll take these questions. Is Jose here? Did Jose come? He should be here. Uh, he, here okay, he may not be here yet, but I was hoping the landscape architect might be here, and I could point you to Jose, uh, because they've done great work. And in the plans, they speak of rooms outdoors and the different characters of those rooms. But I will say just one little footnote. We took down the trees, we had a service for the trees. I mean, I'm sure all of you were shocked when you came up and you looked at the uh, north side of the quad and you realized it was pretty barren. <laughs> and uh, the trees that are there with fences around them will be relocated. But those trees were taken down. They were, all the oak trees were taken to a furniture company locally. They will be turned into the furniture for the micro units that we have. Some of them will be used for the tables and things in the common kitchen area. Uh, and if, you're, if you've been around Yale, you know that Scott Strobel, the provost, has a business in which he makes bowls and pens. So I told him about this. So he's got some of the trees to make bowls and pens. So if you're a donor sitting here, you're probably going to see one of those. <laughs> uh, but we've tried to make use out of all of those things. And we'll have twice as many trees, I counted them, that will be replanted as we're taken down. 
So uh, that's just a little footnote. We've got three questions, and I think what we're going to do is let you ask them in sequence and let them respond uh, to them. So please. Um, my name is Rachel. Um, I have a difficult question, um, and I appreciate what was mentioned um, at the end um, about how the way that we build is an imperative question in our responsibility to others and to our humanity. Um, and I want to ask that um, given the global exploitation of resources that green energy points depend on, like the mining of silicon used to make solar panels, um, how is the school thinking um, theologically about the implications of violence against people and land required for obtaining green energy materials? Good question. So that's one question up here. A second question, right? Yeah. You had a question? Didn't you? Yes. Hi, I'm Susanna at the Future US, a DC based policy accelerator. I'm curious about any policies that you think are urgent for us to consider um, as a country for resource innovation. I'm also curious about whether using AI or machine learning to capture a lot of the intelligence from this living um, building that you're creating uh, regarding how to optimize the utilization of resources and how to manage them and um, yeah, enable other people to learn from that through like an open source model. Okay, thank you. This, these are really good questions. And there's a third question, uh, Chris, and then I'm gonna have to have you do yours afterwards, but right, right straight back. Uh, thank you all for this discussion. Um, currently there is um, vacancy in Wall Street of roughly 25 plus percent. And in Midtown, it's right at 20. Atlanta is 30, across Metro Atlanta. Um, so there's a lot of empty space. And if you're trying to retrofit our old office buildings, it strikes me that retrofitting them when you've got that much free space has got to be cheaper because you can do more of it at once than if the buildings are at least at 90 to 95 percent. Um, also, if you can move your tenants around, then you can take 25% of the space, consolidate it, and then, then retrofit it. So I'm just curious whether you all are discussing with any of your uh, governmental partners whether somebody's looking at maybe a credit system, tax credit system, to encourage this or some other mechanism, because it seems like this is an open window right now that, um, you know, it, it will eventually be absorbed, at least that's the usual path, uh, but it's an opportunity to do it that's not going to be there, hopefully, in the future. Okay, so we have three questions, and I'll let, I don't know, they weren't addressed to any one of you, but first question is about materials. Deborah? I, I, can't, I can't speak for the Divinity School, but I can speak for the work we're doing at the School of Architecture in collaboration with the law school and funding from the Niarcos Foundation to work adamantly and deeply in eliminating indentured labor and labor suffering in building materials, which starts at extraction. And so your point is accurate. Right now, a lot of those abuses are very hard to trace, but we are working on ways of being able to do that in order that we can establish, not unlike a lead guideline, a similar guideline for how to specify materials that are, say, humanely respectfully produce. So that work is underway. It's difficult work to do, but I absolutely agree with the point of your question, and you should know that people are trying to address it. And I'll just add that it underscores the importance of efficiency, right, in t trying to minimize the amount of new renewable energy or new generation necessary um, to power our buildings, power transportation. The Inflation Reduction Act, interestingly, has a big focus on not just, you know, uh, incenting efficiency and uh, installation of renewables, but also onshoring manufacturing. 
um, of uh, clean technologies, including solar panels, focusing on battery recycling, which can hopefully reduce the amount of critical minerals necessary for electric vehicles. Um, and so that, that um, element of the legislation, I think, is, is really important um, to helping to address those issues as well. Um, on the, um, uh, in terms of policy innovation, there's so much to say there, but I think that the focus on holistic approaches to transit-oriented development and re-establishing density um, in our urban centers, I think is an enormous opportunity, um, not just in those major metros that you mentioned, but also um, here in Connecticut. And, uh, and that includes, um, uh, you know, there's a whole co conversation offline on, on some of those things. Brownfield, Exactly, and, and you bet. So I don't, Lindsay. Is there anything going on along these lines? And the, I'm I'm just guessing yes with the standards because there's a very long red list of materials you cannot use to qualify. Do you want to say just a brief word about this question? Uh, well, <clears throat> oh, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I guess a, a couple of things uh, on the different questions. On the, on the commercial to residential conversion question, it is a huge activity in the real estate sector, uh, especially in the US, but also in Europe right now, to do research and provide incentives and other things to uh, allow our downtown cores to repurpose a lot of that space. There, you know, there's a little wait and see about how much of that space is indeed going to not be used for offices, but uh, a lot of movement happening um, around the country, especially in some of those major cities that uh, need to look at how to use their existing buildings more efficiently. Um, on the red list front, I mean, there are, so our, the Living Building Challenge has a, a long list of uh, materials that are not allowed in living buildings, and those are ones that are known to have uh, human health impacts, essentially. So we call that the red list. And one of the hardest parts of building a living building is avoiding all of those uh, toxic materials. Um, it might surprise you to learn that the largest uh, consumer of polyvinyl chloride uh, in our economy is, in fact, buildings. So all of the materials that we use uh, to build buildings are a major piece of the uh, pollution that we're causing from these petrochemicals in our environment. The East Palestine, Ohio train derailment was that type of chemical. It was going to buildings. And so the ways that we can eliminate that type of toxic material from going into buildings is very important. Um, it's oftentimes uh, most impactful to the workers to folks who are extracting or otherwise involved in producing those chemicals or core uh, extracted materials. And so, yeah, just we'll give a shout out as, as uh, Dean Burke mentioned, Yale is doing some fantastic work on the question of how building material supply chains can uh, be made uh, more transparent, uh, ultimately. So we deserve to know where these materials come from in order to be able to demand that they not come from forced labor environments. So, these are all things that are built into the living building challenge. It's one of the things that makes them quite, it makes it quite difficult uh, because we ask people to tell us where these materials come from. And if they can't uh, tell you, then uh, you shouldn't be putting it in a building. But a lot of that type of market transformation is still very early. So um, when it comes to solar panels in particular, uh, there are a lot of uh, conflict minerals and minerals that go into solar panels that can be quite damaging to our environments and, and to the workers and folks who are involved in extracting them. So yeah, it's absolutely very important to do that work. Okay, so we have the question on AI and you got <laughs> the, the question of the decade, <laughs> AI, but you only have a minute or two to respond. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not without thinking about the enormous current carbon footprint of producing AI. Yeah. Yeah, no Agreed. more mining Bitcoin. Um, I just want to go back. I'm, we can talk lots more about machine learning. But on the um, building materials question and renewable energy, there's nothing inherent 
about renewable energy that requires conflict minerals, right? Like we look at mother nature, there is certainly a way to produce energy. And so I think being really mindful that there's nothing inherent about going towards renewable energy. We can do the right thing, go out after renewable energy and do it in the wrong way. And there's opportunities to do it in the right way. There is research going on here at Yale that has been funded by Planetary Solutions about how do I take carbon dioxide out of the air and make building materials? How do I make fuels? How do I make things out of what is a problem and turn it into part of the solution? So there is still a role for technology innovation in this, and that is another big part of the work that Yale as a higher education institution can do is bringing this research to market and the policies that make that work are the tax credits and the Inflation Reduction Act. If you can demonstrate that you are offsetting this much carbon in your technology, you get a tax credit and you become price parity with a petroleum product. So there is an intersection of technology and policy and it goes back to what I was saying before, finding these synergies across campus, across sectors, across perspectives to bring us towards a more sustainable future. Would you join me in thanking our panelists for robust Thank you. Great job.